welcome everyone. It's an honor to be here. Many of us consider ourselves to be storytellers, perhaps even myth makers. And we all know that origin stories are powerful. We need as humans to understand who we are and where we came from, to place ourselves in stories and in history. My story and interests, let's see here. My story and interest in social and environmental issues begins in Mexico City, where I was born and raised by parents educated as chemical engineers. They taught me to see the world from a physical chemical point of view and were known to bring out massive tomes of chemistry, organic and inorganic, whenever they needed to explain something complicated. They instill in me the respect and love for the natural world, but most importantly, for the nature of matter, for its composition, organization, and behavior, its cycles and systems. In other words, they taught me to relate to the world through its design. With this in mind, I created a series called At Any Given Moment. This is At Any Given Moment, Fall One. 20th century composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen said, we are transistors in the literal sense. People always think they are in the world, but they never realize they are the world. What Karl Heinz Stockhausen means is that there are no phenomena in the natural world that do not manifest themselves other than rhythmic or vibratory phenomena. Those vibrations attack us, they modulate us, and in the end become us. I create large-scale immersive installations of video, sound, and matter for a fully embodied experience. The matter in this case is 2.5 tons of lava rocks, gravel, and sand, and I capture the work in 16 millimeter film to emphasize its materiality. This is another installation from the same series at any given moment, Grass 2. It is with burnt wood, and uh, this is in 2010, I did both of these installations, and you're looking at the views from the Williamson Gallery in Pasadena. The projection, just to give you an idea, is 22 feet by 19 feet, with about 30 feet of the material in front. The sound is by composer uh, Drushnur. I love, co I love collaborating with composers. My family spent many of our summer vacations deep in the jungles of southern Mexico in pursuit of obscure imagined archaeological uh, sites. That was my father's passion. During extensive expeditions, we would spend a total of two to three months every year, most of the time camping in the jungle, experiencing its overwhelming presence and sounds. I could at times separate the loud oscillating sounds or dins of the cicada or the soft roar of the howler monkeys feeling the dense humidity. This is one of my first photographs that I took in 1980 with a decent camera, my 35 Nikon, and is in the archaeological site of Piedras Negras or Yokib in Mayan, and it means great gate. You can decipher a little bit, you can see the, the, the face of Chak, the god of the rain, in there at the very center. Sometimes we were able to camp among the Mayan temples, including Uxmal, uh, shown here, surrounded by powerful iconography. This is a drawing by Frederick Catherwood, who in 1839 traveled to Mesoamerica with writer John Lloyd Stevens. Catherwood was trained as an architect, so he began creating detailed visual evidence of the intricate carvings of, and, and structures. With charcoal from our campfire sites, campsite fire, there goes my Spanish not knowing the order of things. So, so you'll hear a few of these ones. Um, but I would make robins of the, rub, rubbings of the glyphs on paper, becoming fascinated with the ancient form of symbolic storytelling. My father also introduced me to, the photography, to photography, starting with the explanation of how Catherwood made these drawings uh, from the Camara Lucida. All of these experiences helped to form me as a designer, as an artist, and now as an earth protector. I believe that art and design can serve as a social force of, for change. 
This perhaps idealistic and utopian vision was the foundation of graphic design when it emerged as a discipline in the 1920s and was what attracted me to the field. In a world that is crying out for concern, engagement, accountability, and commitment, artists and designers can make a difference by becoming actively inf involved in the question of who gets to say what to whom and how is it said. This is a, a, a platform from which I teach, practice, and serve in my community at large. This is a six color silk screen print that was commissioned by the second international poster biennial in Mexico City in 1992. I was invited to join an international group of 40 artists and designers to respond to the theme, America Now, 500 years later. My poster, Exceso de Identidad, Excess of Identity, focuses on the entrap entrap entrapment of identity. With a quote by cultural theorist Trinti Minha, despite our desperate, eternal attempts to separate, contain, and mend, categories always leak. Sometimes I choose to respond to a pressing political or social issue with a quick personal project. In response to the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, I created this work, which I call Crude American Dollars, where oil and money are involved in tens of thousands of deaths and unspeakable atrocities. With this work, I participate in with this work and participating in marches, I joined the, joined the 36 million people across the globe to, that took part in almost 3,000 protests against the Iraq war between January 3rd and April 12th, 2013. Ay, bebe, who, where is that beautiful baby? <laughs> That's beautiful. Mm, song. Brian Collins commissioned me to create a page for this book, uh, Triumph of Commons, 55 Theses on the Future, a collaborative book from 55 artists. My thesis to interpret was, rank is therefore a relationship of deference, while respect is a relationship of reciprocity. Based on the poem by Ralph Al Waldo Emerson, men are respectable only as they respect. And I added, men are respectable only as they, res as they respect women. And here, um, the facts is like every two to four years, the world looks away from a victim count of a scale of Hitler's Holocaust from the LA Times in 2006. In 2004, my design studio decided to donate a great part of our resources to the Los Angeles Commission on Assaults Against Women a non-profit multicultural volunteer organization in Los Angeles whose mission is to build healthy relationships, families and communities free from sexual and domestic and interpersonal violence. They asked me to, they approached me to give the agency a new name and to create a comprehensive brand program. So from 2004 to 2007, we led them through the rebranding process. We helped them in, in repositioning their mission, gave them a new name and a visual vocabulary that we to, to better um, represent the agency's extended mandate, as many more boys and men were actually going to them to, um, uh, to get help. And we helped them with the launch and, impl and implementation. We named them Peace Over Violence, which is an equation that the agency works to resolve every day. The tagline, one on one, one by one, reveals this appro their approach. For the name, though, what we really put forth at the core was a name as an engine, a strategy that the name would function as self-propelling force, a, com a campaign in itself, and a call for, for participation activated by the community. The brand engine is activated by the relationship to any verb or noun that is placed within the equation, blank over violence. The message takes on various characters as personal badge, as I am over violence, as a symbol of collective pride, Latinas over violence, as a call to action, voices over violence, or protest over violence, and as a clear vision, mind over violence, peace over violence. 
Every individual, group, and community is invited to join the cause and dynamically and exponentially propel the agency's voice of a world over violence. With photographer Michael Powers, we created a database of very straightforward, upfront photography of their community. These are her daughters. These are her students. And Kibi and her sister, which I don't remember her name, but it was beautiful to give them this engine and they themselves began activating it. And this is how I learned what BFF means. <laughs> I never had heard of it. <laughs> We created it, all of their commu communication strategy, designing templates, a comprehensive brand standards so they could follow. And then we also did what I thought was strong, like the strongest part. We made an institutional change. We, we asked them to open a design position, an in-house design position and photographer and internships. So since their inception, we, since we, know we, we started doing that, uh, about four different designers from UCLA have held that position and about 10 different interns. It's a prevention. I mean, you go and you tell one kid what's right and what's wrong, and their friends come to them and ask, well, my boyfriend's hitting me, I'm not sure if this is right or not, and they will give the right advice. It's lighting a fire and just spreading the knowledge. And this is simply, we just interviewed the, 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 the tweens and teens, uh, and they themselves were able to express this, so it was very easy for us to edit. Um, public service announcement for Denim Day and Peace Over Violence was created in part of my brand laboratory class at UCLA. I designed the brand, the look and feel. My friend at Ogilvy and Mather, Charles Hall, wrote the copy. But then my students were, con were you know, we were helping them to conceive and go and film this. So two students, um, undergrad students, did the, did, did the filming. And yes, hashtag, me too. I was approached by the organization Refuse Fascism to collaborate in, in graphic design and ended up getting much more involved. This is a longer project. I'm not going to get that into it because I realize I'm running out of time here. But um, Refuse Fascism is a movement of people coming from diverse perspectives united in our recognition that the Trump-Pence regime poses a catastrophic danger to humanity and the planet, and that it is our responsibility to drive them from power. So what I did is that I began very quickly in about, I got involved in December, and in about 10 days, or maybe 15 days, just created a visual language for them. And what I thought about this is that, for me, whenever I'm able to engage in a very quick project like this, it's about exercising my voice. It's like a muscle that if I don't practice when I really need it, it might fail me. So I make sure to practice speaking up. And it was wonderful to begin to see them in all the protests, um, in even the Women's March. I designed the New York Times, Washington Post ads. Um, again, great to see them in the, in the talks. And then I have two um, with, uh, for 10 days, I did, with a couple of grad students and then a, other, a couple of friends, we basically scanned all of the social media, all what was happening in the news, gathered information, and created 10 videos that we uploaded at night. So it was a way of being able for us to respond to this. Um, we refuse to accept a fascist America! We actually have the opportunity to stop this regime before it starts. Unidos Fascista! 
when we filmed ourselves. We went to the, to the march. They hear about the president-elect talking about immigrants, especially Latino immigrants, Mexicans, and they're like, this ain't gonna be good. They especially feel that way if they're Mexican <laughs> or Latino. But then it goes beyond that, because even if you ain't Latino, if you ain't Mexican, do not feel like, good, they ain't coming after me. Because you have lost your humanity if you begin to feel that way. The question that will be asked in the future is, what did people do when this was hanging on the horizon? Did they stand up? Did they flood into the streets? Did they say, no, we will not accept this? We will not allow this and throw their all into it. And that's the question, not just before us, it's the question for millions and millions of people in society. And we have to put that question to people and challenge them to answer it in the way that humanity demands. We refuse to This is a permanent public art project in progress that we competed for and won for the January 8 Memorial Foundation in Tucson, Arizona in 2015. The project consists of a memorial that honors the six victims and 13 survivors of the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords on January 8, 2011, and to design a master plan for El Presidio Park in downtown Tucson. Our team consists of architectural firm Chisalet, Tina Chi and Mark Salet, light consultant Wilfred Kramp, historian and Tucsonian Jackie Kane, and my studio. My role is as an artist of the inner wall of the memorial that is to be completed on January 8, 2019. The story of the lives lost of people wounded at the hand of a mentally deranged gunman on January 8, 2011 in Tucson is told through a symbolic language of, um, that embodies the values and interests held by each of the six people that died and the 13 survivors. Together, the symbols convey the story of Tucson's resilience in the face of climate, conquest, segregation, modernization, and violence as well as Tucson's industrial, technological, and cultural accomplishments. In addition, there are symbols dedicated to the community of first responders, Tucson's history, and the aspirations of a community of the future in the spirit of Together We Thrive. The symbols on the inner wall of the memorial are organized on the memorial wall uh, in a series of lines or strata that evoke the deposition of memory accumulated like geological layers, deposits that reveal the makeup of Tucson. The victim stratum is the only one that contains symbol that are punched through all the way through the thickness of the inner wall, representing a void left by those who died. At night, light fills and radiates, radiates from them. The memorial symbolic language is directly inspired by the petroglyphs left by the Hohokam of the Sonoran Desert in places like Signal Hill and builds upon it. So now you see the images that I showed you at the very beginning. It's like somehow I'm exactly kind of you know, building from that for myself. Each of the victims gets seven symbols that are personal to them. For instance, Gabe Zimmerman, who died, was a community outreach coordinator for the Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. The, symbol, the symbols are determined by conversations with those directly affected, family members of the slain, the ones that survived with their wounds, plus research into the many articles, local and national media, devoted to the tragedy as well as several looks. Uh, books on the matter. Uh, Barack Obama, it was one of his most wonderful uh, speeches was um, when, when he gave it to, in Tucson. So this is Gabe's full constellation of symbols. Each constellation has 33 perforations or voids representing the 33 rounds that were shot. The scales of, for justice, of justice for federal judge John, John Roll, the butterfly for Christina Taylor Green, which was her last drawing, or the Hohokam Eagle for the New Jersey snowbird Phyllis Schneck. And this is another um, 
for each one of the symbols that you've seen here, I've gone through this process. So far I have done maybe about uh, 40, and I'm gonna have 170 to make in total. So ah, this is gonna, <laughs> yeah, tendonitis. <laughs> um, and then this is his constellation. I never thought I would be designing a sprinkler, but he was a, a fire in charge of fire at Raytheon. The two highest constellations each place at the apex are both uh, on both uh, poles of the memorial capture the spirit of Together We Thrive. And what was really beautiful is that we went to interview high school students to tell us what is it that they wanted or hoped for, for their city, their country, and themselves for the future. We also are, um, have done in intensive um, research in terms of its history because we made the decision to, um, within the larger civic and historical context, to place the memorial. And in a history dating from 10,000 BC to the present, uh, it is to be told through symbols in the inner wall as well. So you'll see just a few pages of about maybe 35 pages that we have in history. At times, it becomes a weeping wall. Let's say that it is Christina Taylor Green's birthday and only her constellation just very gently water begins to weep. We are looking at whether to do it in court and steel, but we also understand that in Tucson at times it can be 120 degrees and we don't want to fry people. So we are thinking also of perhaps maybe a kind of concrete and then aluminum. But just the same way that I was doing the rubbings of the glyphs, one of the things that I thought would be very important is to take a memento that you can actually bring any paper and even with your hand or your spoon or your something from lunch that you can actually bring something home. And I've mentioned that we've done uh, several uh, uh, publications. This is the first book that um, describes the, the symbols that we had done up to date. And then augmented reality would be very important in this project. Circumsolar, a long-term cross-disciplinary and multimedia project that follows the, uh, the journey of a small seabird, the Arctic tern, Sterna Paradisia, on the annual migration from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again. A 60,000 mile journey that is the longest migration of any creature, uh, uh, longest migration recorded. The Arctic tern experiences two polar summers in a year, which makes it the one creature that lives the most daylight of any creature in the world. So this is a project that I've been working on for many, many years with a, a partner, my partner, Adam Ewens. And I don't have time to get into this, but this is what I'm gonna be talking in my workshop. But I will just show you um, a little bit. I, there is a 26 minute video that you can find in my website that if you want to see that, um, it's, uh, it's Rebecca Mendes studio, you can see it there. This is shown at a light festival in Santa Monica. Oh, that was the most important pass. I'm missing my film. Ah, oh, there. This project focuses on the mating se season on the, how do you call it when they have babies, their hatching season um, in the north. So I filmed it all with 16 millimeter camera and with uh, HD, all, all in Svalbard, um, Finland, Iceland. And what inspires me about this is the Arctic turn has a determination for survival and evolution. And I look to her to inspire me that for us as a human species, I feel that we have lost our clarity on how to survive and evolve. Artists Helen Mayer and Newton Harrison, known as the Harrisons, are perhaps one of the very first self-proclaimed echo artists, and they are they see their, as they are, their actual client, the environment, the earth, and they always ask, what does the river want? 
What does the forest want? So that is something that the reason I'm bringing them up is that I designed uh, uh, this proposal for a book that's still in the works. But um, one of the things that I feel that is very important to talk about is that in the force majeure works, which is the ones I selected for the book, they underline the, lie, the law of, the, of Mother Earth. Nature has agency, nature has no waste, nature creates itself continually through the processes of exchange, nature mostly stores excesses, excess energy in various forms of carbon. Inspired by Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate, and the Harrison's life work, I formed and named the Counterforce Lab, a research and fieldwork studio based on the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA, which is dedicated to using art and design to develop creative collaborations, new fields of study, and methods to research, create, and execute projects that investigate the social and ecological concerns of what some researchers are calling the Anthropocene era, a time when human, human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and in the environment. And at its core, it has artistic fieldwork practice. Creating this lab has helped me to build bridges between the arts and the humanities and the sciences I am in the network of faculty at the Laboratory of Environmental Narrative Strategies, which is an incubator for new research and collaboration on storytelling and communications and media in the service of environmental conservation and equity. And I recently served in the faculty jury for the inaugural Pritzker Emerging Environmental Genius Award. So there's so much that I am able to connect within UCLA with, um, uh, with the environment. The Counterforce Lab's first initiative was to participate in Tax Summer School. And I'm going to really just rush through these because I know that I am over time. But our goals were to, we brought six students um, from four different schools to MARFA. And our goal was to expand contemporary discourse, social practice, and politics in art to create a unique experience and opportunity for emerging artists to gain an, understand, an understanding of the dynamics and social impact of art in public spaces. The second has been in winter 2016, I taught a class for my undergrad senior class as Counterforce Lab. And in this project, Hamun, my students, st uh, started with the premise that it is disconcerting that in our post-human thought, we find that in general, we cannot avoid the animal suffering around us. But there are so many contradictory foundations on which to judge the good or the right thing to do about this. We as a civilization need to find the right thing to do respecting life on Earth. The students envision that 500 years into the future, human cannibalism is a norm, that humans breed for consumption, are an inferior class called the Hamuns. They are not allowed agency over their own lives. Humans think of Hamun solely as a food resource, which is, I think, this project, the provocative press, uh, premise to reevaluate current human treatment of animals. And in this, my, the URL, you can see the rest of the projects of my students that I think they're fantastic. Of course, I love them. <laughs> I wouldn't say anything different, but they're very, very, very intelligent and powerful. And then I want to close with this project that um, I call I Am Many, which was commissioned by the AIGA. As, um, as it's been mentioned, this year I was awarded the AIGA medal and was invited to participate in the first AIGA limited editions with a theme of hierarchy. As the first Latina to receive this honor since its inception in 1920s, the theme of hierarchy really hit a chord. The origin of the word is from the Greek hierarches, sacred ruler. So, so far humanity has acted over the species and over the earth as a sacred ruler. So for this project, I focus on a post-human message. Post-humanism exa examines the ethical implications of expanded, expanding the circle of moral concern and extending subjectivities beyond the human species. It is broadly known that we are biologically very close to plants and nearly identical to our cousins, our animal cousins. I chose this quote by Donna Haraway in her book, When Species Meet. 
I love the fact that human genomes can be found in only 10% of all the cells that occupy my body. The other 30% of the cells are filled with the genomes of bacteria, fungi, protists, and such, some of which play in a symphony necessary for my being alive at all, and some of which are hitching a ride and doing the rest of me, the rest of us, no harm. I am vastly outnumbered by my tiny companions. To be one is always to become one with many. This is the making, first time I ever touched porcelain, and um, I love kind of putting challenges to myself like that. So this is an edition available through the AIGA. As storytellers, we have an opportunity to change the conversation, to tell a story of self in relation, but not only at planetary scale, but within the history of the universe, what American historian David Christian calls big history. In a 13.8 billion year history of the universe, humans have only existed in the world for 200,000 years. This represents the last millimeter of the last sheet of a 400 sheet of toilet paper roll. And I'm sure you've heard that. It's so beautiful. Imagine that, just the last little tiny little bit. So as long as we don't have a sense of this big history, it will be very hard to understand ourselves as humans and that we share urgent problems that we need to work together with. This is a time with circum when circumstances are calling on everyone to engage. And I believe that we, as creative thinkers, as communicators, must respond to the, in the face of prejudice, find our voice, and make an especially powerful contribution to a better society and a healthy planet. Gracias. So nice to meet you. Wow. I, I seriously, I know I've said this for a lot of people, but we could talk for a long time about many of these yes. projects. Um, could we just, uh, to go back to the Tucson project for just a minute, how did you and the team talk about what the experience should be of, of approaching and being yeah. within, within what you were making? Yeah. You have so many levels of engagement, right? And, and for us, it was because it was so wonderful to be able to work so closely with the families of the victims, with the survivors themselves, we were able to understand from them, and most of them do not want so much attention to be called to them. So you see how I then I take the names out, right? So, Part, the very first experience is for you to be able to have a space to mourn, to be able to be in a chapel-like space. So very hard you know, to, to describe it, but if you imagine it's an embrace, we call it the embrace. At both of the apex, it goes down and the wall goes higher. So you have a space that, whereas all the traffic maybe is going from here and there is a you know, very low fountain, then as you go down, you enter more silence. Right? And at the same time, you know that people will go there the way that they go to the um, a memorial of Maya Lin of the Vietnam Memorial. And that some people go there to very much be in, inward and some other people really just go as tourists. So we needed to consider both kind of experiences. So in many ways there is, as you go into the center, it's the most quiet, but there's enough space for one to be able to stay there and then other people to go around. But the experience night and day was an important thing in terms of considering what happens when only the, the, the victims glow at night and that the rest are present and it's all its history, but that you're able to touch the symbols, you're able to make a rub down, so that we wanted really to have people to have a, a, you know, a, a greater embodied experience in there. The experience of witnessing shootings and mass shootings over and over and over again, which sadly is now part of all our lives. I just, I was so moved by what you were able to do for the families in really knowing the victims and finding ways for others to know them, again, without getting too much, without getting too hung up on, on them as symbols of, of something. Yes, exactly, and it's difficult because, for example, for me, the symbols, they need to be so simple because they need to be able to cut through the court and steel. So I, I, there's, you know, specific, 
uh, uh, limitations that I have. And at the same time, you know, just the same way that uh, Paul Mixenar, who designed the symbols of Schiphol in, in the airport and designed the JF, uh, JFK uh, station in New York, he says symbols are only something that will kind of like give you a little guide, it puts you in a space, but they cannot express so much the specifics. So publishing the books, having a, a, an exhibition that will be in the courthouse and the augmented reality will tell a greater story. But for me is to be able to tell enough that you have a sense of a life in, you know, seven symbols. I was, getting, I was getting ready to come here today and looking at uh, the photos that you've taken and some photos of you in all these amazing places in the world in extreme environments like the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered what, what is more essential for you? Is it being there in the space or bringing it back to others? Mm. Being there. Being there. I mean, I think that to experience life, to experience nature, to experience the everythingness and nothingness in the same space, and to have a sense of, the, of your context. Speaking about understanding where you belong in this entire history, not only humbles you, but gives you a sense of, that you have to value life like you won't believe and protect life, protect your planet. That said, um, I know that part of what I'm interested in this technologically mediated nature is that more and more, and I would say less and less, people are experiencing nature in the natural world. I gave a class and I asked my students to, it was, we were, I were collaborating with Greg Lynn, an architect, and his class in Vienna, they were creating space colonies, and then my class was creating, what if nature do you bring? How do we experience nature in a space colony? The natural world of, of the earth. And what was fascinating was that my students very quickly just Googled, Nature. <laughs> and I told them, go, get dirty, bring samples. You, wait, you're kidding. You're kidding. Googled nature. Not all of them. <laughs> a few. So you know how I could tell? Because I could tell that they were having the same images, right? And I just went oh. to my computer and I go, I Googled nature. And they were so embarrassed because they realized they didn't give themselves the time to do and to go to the field uh, work that we needed. But that said, if everything is vibratory phenomena, if everything is, you know, light, color, solidity, everything is vibrating at a different speed, then can I create an experience that you actually feel the presence of the universe, the presence of life through an installation of light? So I have for me, that is my task. And, and you know, with the two installations, with the rocks and the grass, I mean, and the grass and the, and the wood, what was beautiful was that the director of the gallery said that people would come, the employees and some of the students would come, bring their lunch, and sit for an hour experiencing the work. A video projection can have that power. So that is something that the, the closer I get to be able to give an embodied experience through light and sound, I'm getting closer to what the space colonies will need. <laughs> Yeah. What's restorative for you right now? Breathing. I sometimes don't find much of the time to go out and about, but I'm starting to discover myself, um, like just the same way that I go out, I'm going in. And this universe, <laughs> this incredibly complex system and organism is to be explored and to use my senses, for example, our senses, we are so used to seeing a radar of perception as openings to receive. Well, we can also use them to shut, right? And to be able to just go within. So when I am not able to actually go and just lay down in, in a cushiony moss and, you know, pursue my Arctic turn and just spend... You know, I go to a farm in the north of Iceland myself with my little car and I drive six hours to the north of Iceland and just loving the space. And I arrive to this place that I see the, the greatest colony of, of, of Arctic Tern. I go to the farmer, I say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to sleep in my car and I'm going to just be filming, so I'm, I'm, don't worry about me. 
No, you're not sleeping in the car. Here's bread. You start doing the bread, and then you're going to help me with this. They gave me a bed, and I spent a whole week there. So the extremes, right, of going and being able to dare to explore the world on your own and to actually dare to die, right? For me, it's like I go in this Arctic expedition, and I'm in Svalbard, and they tell you, if you from the sailboat go into the dinghy and you fall, if we leave you in the water, you leave no, leave. Live for six seconds. And if we take you out of the water, you live for three seconds. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. So there's something about being able to put oneself in, in, in places that just remembers you, uh, resensitizes you. And you don't have to go and do that. But at least touch the water of the river. <laughs> it's a big relief. <laughs> um. It's been a bit of a year for a lot of people. <sighs> to say the least. <laughs> um, and we say, we say rather quickly that uh, to, to do some work that we find meaningful is to, is to, you know, is to heal yourself, to take care of yourself, and to do something, and to put something positive in the world. Yeah. Um, you spend so much of your time in that form of work. Is that working for you right now? Uh, yes and no. Yes, yes, and I know my limits. For example, with Peace Over Violence, when I worked for four years, it started to be at a point that I did not know my limits, and at one point I just was sobbing like a baby morning, day, and night. So I was too much for me to be able to be listening to, you know, um, uh, and be interviewing rape victims, and it was, it's really tough. So to know when you need to, to peel off is important. So uh, with all this year, um, I did uh, a total of a month with a no campaign. And at that moment I said, no! Just like, Ugh. I've done what I can and don't call me again, <laughs> right? And here are my students and everything like that. And I said, in six months, let me approach you when I have recharged. So I went a, a month in a residency in Mexico and I recharged so beautifully. It was Mexico City and I saw so much art and re-inspired yeah. and I saw otherness. So it's about being able to do that now. That's when you have space. Otherwise, I don't hear the news for a good four or five days sometimes, and I take lots of baths and lots of walks and watch my birds and draw, pet my cat. Recharge. Recharge. And then I engage again with full force. So it's about truly night and day, night and day. I am really tempted to make Renee and Martha come out here and drag us off the stage, but it would be really mean to everybody else who's still on the program. Rebecca Mendez, this has just been fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much, April. Thank you.